Well, hello and welcome to another Dev Nation. I'm super excited to be here today because we have Emmanuel Bernard, who's actually one of our resident experts in all things Hibernate, but he's also a key contr uh, contributing member to Quarkus, meaning he's one of the guys who invented this technology. So he can really take us deep down this path uh, in the next 30 minutes we have together. And I actually, I've known Emmanuel now for probably about 13 solid years. So he and I go way back. Uh, I'm not saying that we actually like each other, but you know, we tolerate each other pretty well. So it is a great pleasure. I'd like to introduce Emmanuel Bernard. He's gonna take us into this presentation right now. Do make sure you throw your questions into the chat tab and feel free to help everyone understand. They have to refresh the browser to hear things and see things. Thank you so much. Let's go, Emmanuel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I love you, Bill. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, really happy to go and explain uh, what we're gonna talk about today, which is how does Quarkut handles persistence and how can you take Hibernate to the next level? Uh, let me share my screen right there. So let's do a little bit of slides and then I'll actually go most of the time uh, doing, going to do a demo to show you everything in action. <laughs> so what is Quarkus, first of all, very quickly, because some of you might have already seen the, the previous definition. So it's literally a stack to write Java applications, uh, nothing more, nothing less, uh, but uh, we're gonna see how it makes it uh, in a very unique way. Um, well, you can write just about any Java app and so on, we do focus on a few things. First of all, we're cloud native in the sense that the uh, we, we expect, uh, it, we make it very natural to work in a very, uh, let's say agile de deployment platform. Uh, and by that, I'm thinking about the container platform like Kubernetes and, and so on, where you can really deploy stuff on the fly, scale to maximum levels very quickly, you know, add new services and, and so on. And we do focus on microservices uh, in the sense that we really work hard to make the startup time very small and the memory usage very small. When you go from one monolith to 20 microservices, then whatever overhead you had in memory starts to pile up. And that's what we wanted to address. And finally, serverless, I did mention startup time, but serverless is keen into low memory usage, but also startup time has to be really fast. And that's what we worked on, make Java uh, really shine into those uh, three you know, pillar environments. So Quarkus has four benefits. Uh, the one I will, I will really focus today is benefit number one, which is a developer joy. And I will show that in the with a persistence angle. Um, <clears throat> we'll see, we reuse a lot of existing technology that you know and use already, whether they are standards or you know, de facto standards, but we make them easier to use by unifying a lot of the configuration. We've got an awesome um, um, development mode, which uh, makes the feedback loop from write, from coding to testing, back to coding, you know, very, very fast. And essentially, we, we try to list all of the common usage and patterns and simplify them. That's what Panache is about and that we're gonna talk about today. Um, the benefit number two is the memory improvement and, and uh, the startup time improvement. So I won't go into too much detail, but this is a real life REST plus JPA application. If you take the stacks that are existing out there, you're, you will use probably about 218 uh, resident set size memory, not just the heap side, the resident set size, which is the one that matters because that's when something like Kubernetes will start to kill your process when you go over. Quarkus is about half that uh, usage total uh, when you use it. And if you go for native image compilation, which we'll discuss very quickly uh, a bit, uh, you can get another 8x you know, uh, factor. Startup time is really impressive as well. Uh, existing stack go from you know, nine seconds to, and Quarkus to 2.5. And if when you use the native image compilation, we're talking about tens of milliseconds. For Java, that's, that's unheard of. Benefit number three um, is uh, right now, if you have to do a reactive application, that's literally a different stack, different components that your classical imperative uh, model, uh, we are unifying that with Quarkus. I think there is a DevNation set up for that very specific subject, so I won't dive into that subject. And also, um, 
Quarkus is made of all of the technologies you're already using, whether it be Ibernet, Vertex, rest -Easy, and so on and so on. So uh, it's really ba based on the things you already know, which means you already have five years of experience with Quarkus, which is always a nice benefit. And uh, that's enough talking. Let's go uh, into the, the demo. So I cheated a bit, uh, and I prepared the... Um, um, Oops. Uh, yeah, I prepared, I literally created, a, a, you know, the, the default project uh, with Quarkus. We have a way to do that with a Maven plugin. Then I uh, copied the, um, uh, the front end, you know, resources like JavaScript and so on, just because it's not the area we're going to focus on today. And uh, I opened my, my idea, my, my um, sorry, my ID. And in this case, this is IntelliJ. And what we have is essentially, uh, uh, rest easy uh, resources that will return uh, when you call hello and um, you know that's that's a default one so let's get it started um, you know nothing fancy here except I will use the oops I will use the Quarkus uh, dev mod which is the live reload mod which is the way the way you tend to write Quarkus application you start this mode and you, you keep starting on this one so you see that the debugging is enabled so you can activate a debugger right on the fly and here the install feature are CDI and rest easy for my for my application and if I go and literally <clears throat> ask my application I've got a landing page that explains to me what to do with uh, Quarkus and if I go for the hello resource then you know i see hello nothing fancy here so let's go and do a dev nation let's say hello dev nation i go back i refresh and i see the change right away right uh hello dev nation live i go and refresh oops got an error oh uh, yes he told just told me that i probably messed up my my java syntax yes i actually deleted the uh um, the comma here, refresh, and I'm back here. I didn't repackage, recompile, did anything on that. I went from my IDE to my browser and back to my IDE, and everything was working. But how, how does it work? Essentially, you can see it in the source. Quarkus, actually, when you do a browser query, it will look if any file has changed in your application. If they, and if there is one file, whether it be a Java file or a resource, then it will stop the, well, it will compile the file, stop the Quarkus application, restart the whole Quarkus application and answer you. And in this case, it's in under 300 milliseconds, which means by the time you flip to the, the other bro the brother, you're already live and ready. So that's very, very powerful. And we apply the same kind of logic for tests. So if I run this test, uh, it will fail because uh, as you say, I'm, I'm, as you see, I'm expecting hello here. Uh, so let me prepare the correction for for the test. Um, and what the test does, thanks to the add Quarkus test, is literally start the full Quarkus application, and then you run the test, uh, embedding the test, and then you can run whatever test you, you want to run in the application. And because it's so fast, it makes tests uh, very fast. You don't have to wait for seconds and seconds to get started. Oh, I guess I started it again by accident. OK, but that's, that's nice, but uh, it's a very simple application. What I want to actually do oh, actually let me restart it uh, what i want to actually do is um write a to-do application uh which has i do have the front end but i have no back end so if i do do something then actually nothing happens because there is no route no rest endpoint that actually answer uh, do something so what i need to do is add hibernate and a few other dependencies right um, i can uh, just delete my pom file but in this case I want to explore a bit. So I can use Quarkus.live uh, extensions. Not live, sorry, list extensions, <clears throat> which will list me all of the uh, Quarkus. I'm missing here. Um, last year, in one second. Well, it's not really a problem. So um, list extension, we list uh, the list of extensions you can also see in the uh, on the website. Uh, so if you go to quarkus.io slash extensions, you will see we've got lots and lots of extensions here that are essentially your, your dependencies. Um, so 
let me speed by a little bit here and by uh, adding the extensions uh, that we are interested in uh, today. Um, so as you can see, there is the JDBC Postgres driver, there is Hibernate ORM with Panache, we're going to mention that a bit later, and Hibernate Validator and the JSON binding for REST easy. And when I do, <clears throat> when I do this operation, then it's just uh, uh, does nothing uh, very fancy. It's literally just a bet your POM. If you see uh, IntelliJ, it just says, hey, your POM has changed. Uh, do you want to, uh, you know, uh, onboard that? And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing Postgres, Panache, and Hibernate Validator. Okay, the second step is probably to set up a database. Uh, so if you're familiar with Hibernate, you have to go and set up a persistence.xml. If you're not so familiar with Hibernate, you might not know exactly all of that incantation and the essentially a choreography you have to do to set up that. So Quarkus simplifies that by going into a single configuration file. Uh, of course, you can use persistence.xml if you really need to uh, or want to because you want to stay uh, in this model. But here we really try to simplify it. Just the fact that you have data sources, URL driver, and so on is enough, and uh, at entity class somewhere in your application is enough for Hibernate to start properly. And here I've added a couple of extra um, you know, Hibernate specific properties. Okay, uh, we're ready to go. Let's uh, define a to-do resource. That to-do resource is gonna be the back end of my application. So it's gonna be a rest easy resource. <clears throat> Finding uh, as answering on API and I will consume, <clears throat> sorry, oops. I'll consume, yeah, JSON um, structures and probably produce also JSON structures. And the next step is say to answer, to get the list of all of the resources, all of the to-do in my application. So it's a get and I do a list of to-do and that all. Think about the flow of my of my coding, right? So I, I just write what I want and then I'm thinking, okay, I need this to do, which is my JSON file. So I need to create it. That's the Java representation of my JSON file. So I go and create this file. And because it's a relatively simple application, that JSON file will also be my uh, entity. So I'll mark it as add entity. Uh, and I can use regular Hibernate and then in my uh, resource file here, just do an add inject of uh, of the entity manager and use use it the normal way you use Hibernate. But here I want to use uh, Hibernate with Panache and specifically the Active Record way to do that. So Active Record is essentially a way to merge the entity code and the repository code or the DAO code in, into one class. So let's do that. It's a I do extend at Panache entity, which means I generate a few. Uh, utility methods, which we will see, and also uh, the ID, right, so by default, uh, if I want to. So here I can focus on my business logic and say, well, a to-do as a title. Uh, you know, it's a regular entity, so I can make it, uh, I can put the, the GPA annotations. Uh, I can use the Hibernate validator annotations or the Bean validation annotation rather. Um, I can add more properties. I'll say that uh, a, prop, a, a to do can be completed or not completed. And I say maybe I want an order of the to dos to make priorities, right? So I'll put it here. And because order is a reserve keyword, I'll name the column something else. Um, ordering, there you go. Okay, I've used public fields, which might be a bit uh, uh, strange to you, uh, but it's much simpler not to have to generate the getters and the setters and maintain that. So in your to-do resource, you will just use the, the public fields. If you say, oh, but I want this abstraction, I want the encapsulation, you can definitely uh, create, oh, sorry. You can definitely create your uh, getter and setter. And if they are present, well, they will be used. So when you do to do in to do resource, when you do to do dot URL using the public field, then the get URL will be actually wired in your access. And the reason is that 
Uh, Quarkus does a lot of things at build times, which means it can do bytecode announcement and transform the code to really be associated. So you can use the, the getters to abstract. Maybe if you want to do a two lowercase or something like that, right? So that's business meaning. Otherwise, just keep the public field. That's going to be a bit more efficient for you. And, uh, I, I mean, as code, right? The way the way the code shows, uh, not so much in you know uh, actual performance efficiency. All right, so we've got the to-do uh, entity. And when I say I merge the entity and the DAO in one thing, that's that's what I mean. I can return, I, I access my DAO, which also is my entity, and then I've got a list of interesting features, interesting operations here, like list all, which is what I want. But I probably want to order them, so I'll also say that I want to order, order them by, uh, by the order field. And I can go back to my application, refresh, and I still see nothing, which is okay. I forgot that uh, I didn't set up any fixture to, uh, you know, add data to my database. So I'll again cheat a little bit to speed dial that. Um, for people not familiar with Hibernate, you can create an import that XML that SQL file. There you go. And I'm just inserting that, going back to the browser refresh. So not only Java files are refreshed, but also resources, which is really great. Uh, too small. There you go. And I've got my application. It's read only right now. If I say do something, it still does nothing. So let's go and let's go and uh, write down this uh, second part. So that would be a that would be a um, yeah post. And <laughs> it's gonna return a Jaxorus response, and that's going to create my to do. And that, that is the JSON file, I, uh, the JSON stream that I'm receiving being transformed into a Java file, OK? Um, well, that's a creation, so I want it to be transactional. Uh, I didn't show you, but if you go there, you will see that we have started with uh, a lot of things, like the connection pool, CDI, Hibernate ORM, Hibernate Validator, Narayana, which is our transaction, full transaction uh, a stack so we can start the full transaction and still be extremely fast uh, and also i'll use bin validation so that normally the, in this method that's where you will want to decide to okay i want to validate the input to make sure somebody is not trying to uh, pawn my uh, uh pull my websites but let's assume all of that has been uh, written down as uh, hibernate validator rules um, what do I need to do here? Just actually persist this object. So I can do to do, persist. That's all. You see how it flows very nicely from your code. And then I just need to return the response uh, I have created. So I'll return the creation and probably passing back the to do that has been created and built. OK. And if I go back, I refresh. Uh, actually, I didn't have to refresh. Uh, I can say do something, and now I see that do something has been created. And if I refresh, it's still in the in the database. However, if I change the state, the update operation, then it's lost because update has not been implemented. So let me implement it. Again, uh, it's it's very much the same logic. So I will I will just copy paste uh, something a bit quickly. Take the code. Uh, go back here, and the update is implemented as a patch operation in, uh, in in REST. Then I can get going, refresh, and oops, compilation error. Yes, never trust a code that you copy from somewhere, especially Stack Overflow. So please read it below. But here we saw that there was a problem. Go back, we refresh, and now I can mark the operation as changed, and and it's it's working. Uh, the other operation, a bit more complex, that I want to show you is the clear completed. So clear completed is supposed to delete from my database the completed operations. Um, let's go and implement it. It's going to be a delete operation. Uh, again, it's going to be transactional, so I'm going to set that up. And <clears throat> I'll return a response. I want, and I'll ask to say delete completed. <coughs> And here, again, I'll use my DO, which is also my active record pattern, and say, delete completed. So here, I don't use a default method. I just want my custom method in the DO, OK? And from there, I can just say return, I think it's a response, uh, no body, no content, rather, and I'm doing it, OK? Then I go back to my 
here in my flow. So I've written the flow of my method and then I can go and fix the, uh, you know, the red arrows. And here I want to just create the method delete completed and I navigate to my, my DAO, which is also my entity, which is very convenient. And then I decide to write the delete operation. So I could say load all the entity and delete them, but here we'll just use a delete query, uh, which is something that is uh, supported by, uh, by JPM, by Hibernate. And here I say delete completed. True. That sounds scary. What, what is this language? It's actually HQL, it's JPQL, except we infer a lot of the context. We know we are on the to do. So select to do from to do where it's inferred. You, you, you can actually write it down here. You can say delete to do and so, and so on. But here we infer that you do you know everything the from and et cetera is inferred up to the where clause. And then you can define the clause. Uh, and you could say completed equals something. But here, because equals something is only there is a single parameter and it's the first parameter, we just ignore this one and you just write completed. So it's plain HQL, except it's very contextualized. Um, let me show you another one that I love. Uh, let's say we want to write the search engine for that. Uh, for that to-do app. So I want to return to-dos. Yes, it's a Java utilist. Uh, and that's my search engine. And let's say my search engine receives world. We want to do pagination, right? Uh, you're a busy person, so you probably have lots of uh, uh, to-dos to do. <clears throat> so page here is a panache, a panache type that lets you handle the pagination uh, logic. So let me import it. And from there, uh, just just page, just so you know, you can <clears throat> create it. I want a page of 25 elements, so 25 by 25. And I want maybe the second page, so that's the index, third page, index number three, and so on and so on. And from there, I can write the query. So my query is a bit more complex because I want to say, I want the world to be like uh, the world that I'm receiving and completed probably should be false, right? So. From there, I can say uh, pass the first parameter as world and oops, oops, question mark number two. And here, probably, I want the to dos that are not completed in my search engine. That's probably the one that makes more sense. Then I apply the page and I return the list. And that's it, I've made a search engine. <clears throat> and you can see how um, uh, Panache queries, the contextual query can scale much better uh, as, as, you know, as more parameters are coming in and, and so on. Um, that's all I wanted to show you on the code side. Uh, let me show you a little bit how you would make that application run in a native uh, way. So for people that have tried to use a Graal VM and compile your application natively, first of all, you've seen that it fails <laughs> because there is a lot of constraints. But Quarkus actually handles all of that for you and also simplified the way to uh, do the compilation. So you just say, I want to package, but I want to compile, compile stuff also in the native compilation, not just uh, you know Java jars. And it takes, takes a while because it does a lot of um, complex analysis to compile your Java application, not at runtime, but at build time. So I'll put a notification here. And in the meantime, uh, let me actually go back to the Quarkus website. Uh, there is guides that are uh, very oriented into how do I need to do this stuff concretely? And we've got a ton of those, uh, whether they are about configuration, logging, SSL, web stuff, data stuff, messaging, security, cloud, observability, and so on and so on. The one I want to uh, dive into is the Hibernate ORM with Panache. So as we've seen, you don't have to set up a persistence.xml. We can infer it from the shared Quarkus application.properties file. And you can use the active record way to write an entity by extending Panache entity. We do recommend you use public fields because it makes the code a bit more compact and easier to read. And you, you know, essentially have your re repository methods on, on the entity itself. Um, here we've seen the configuration. Uh, all of those are mandatory. The other one is optional. Um, you, you can write the getters and the setters and do something with them. And then Quarkus again will rewire the, the call to dot name to dot get name inside your application. So you, you get the abstraction without having the, any problem here. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen that uh, because it's an active record pattern, you've got operations on the entity itself, like persist, is persistent, delete, list all, find by ID, uh, list which accepts a query, which is a contextualized HQL query. So it can be very compact. Uh, so it's very nice. You can do counts or count with a query and so on and so on. So I'll let you go there. <laughs> you can retrieve the list. You can do streaming to you know play with the uh, uh, collections, the stream, uh, the Java streams. You can do pagination. So you define the page size, you define which page specifically you want. You can move to the next page. And of course, when you do list, you will on, only get those 25 results. That, that makes sense. Also, you've got the page count, which means you just say ask for page count and we do the query, give you back the list of the number of pages expected. Right. So it's um, very easy to make those kind of classical multi, you know, search search engine. Um, sorting, we've seen, sorting, sorry, we've seen. So either you put it in the query itself or you exter externalize it. So it depends on your on your taste here. Um, simplified query, uh, I don't like to, for them to be called simplified because you can make very complex query. They're just contextualized. So the from entity is optional, the where is optional, the order by is optional, and we focus on the the, the predicates, but then you can write the form if you want to want to want to do a form with a join or anything like that. It's uh, you just pass this more complex line to the list opera operation. You can have parameters. I've seen a, I've shown a little bit how it works. The one thing I wanted to mention is uh, some people don't like to merge the entity code and the um, the, the the repository code. They like to keep it separated. You can no problem. You just create your class, you make it implement, implement the Panache repository, and then you put the same method that I was mentioning. And of course, you've got the find by ID and all of those operations that you had on the uh, active record entity. The only additional step you have to do is to add inject the repository in your code and then call the repository to do your operations, which means from a coding point of view, I don't know if you've not seen, but the have been really moving, uh, stayed within the same code, the same um, uh, call that methods and so on, not having to go back up in my code and back down. So that's the kind of thing we're, we're trying to, to limit. Um, I won't spend more of your time. Um, just a conclusion, you've got a full stack, including JPA transaction manager. It starts really fast with the live reload and you can edit your stuff in the database with the live reload, which is really great. And we try to simplify this. The simple stuff should really, uh, sorry, the common stuff should really be made simple. And that's what we've been working on as long as the very short code to test uh, loop. And that's all I wanted to say to you today. I hope there is you know, a couple of questions, then we can have a conversation. We do have a couple of questions, a couple of questions, Emmanuel. One that I think is actually important, and that is related to panache and uh, relationships, one to many, many to one. How would you handle yeah. those in a panache based application? It would just work. Um, so panache is actually a layer on top of uh, GP and Hibernate. So everything that you're used to working in Hibernate is just work. So many to many, one to many, all of that is, is, is orthogonal to the whole panache aspect. If your query becomes complex and involves relations, that's what I was mentioning, where in the list, instead of just passing the predicate, you will pass probably a more complex form clause with joins and then the, the where clause associated to it. So, but just the way you use it in, in, uh, in Hibernate. So it makes it easy for the simple case, but doable for the complex case. That's, that's the logic we were trying to run with uh, for Panache. Okay, and then just kind of a, Reiteration of a point, do I need to use a persistence XML with Panache or can I, should I, what, what is the strategy there? You can. So if you're very much into keeping your application standard, go for it. Uh, but if you, you don't have to, you don't have to do this extra ceremony, uh, just define your data source in Quarkus and off you go. So that's the recommended way to get started. And if your application becomes too complex and needs a separated persistence for dot XML for complex settings, whatever, then you can go and use it. Again, opinionated and very simple, but doable for the more complex case. Okay, one last question, and then we do, do need to kind of wrap up here soon. And that is related to migration. So a lot of people, you know, that's a common question is, 
hey, how, what does it take to migrate an existing application over to this new world? What strategies do you have and recommendations for people? So uh, what we've seen is, so first of all, we we use a lot of existing frameworks and standards. So if you your application was using CDI and Hibernate and, and uh, JaxRS and so on and so on, uh, we've seen quite a few people actually taking their applications, spending half a day on it and make it, making it run on Quarkus and be like really impressed by the ease, ease of use. Uh, on that front. Um, if you are, uh, what was the second part of your question? I'm lost. In. Well, just, just overall strategies for migrating from an existing code base into Quarkus. That's all. Yeah, okay. So to be fair, it's really for, you know, Greenfield application would be the, the easiest way to get started. If you feel like your application is already somewhat in the microservices front and you want to port this stuff in a limited amount of time, that you know, the fact that we've reused all of those existing libraries and we just we don't even new APIs or new annotations. We just expose the one you know and we make them run much much faster from a build startup time point of view and the amount of memory we you use. That's all. Yeah. So yeah. It's not magic, but yeah. it's it's getting closer. <laughs> But I really do love the point you made. We have seen a number of people out in the social media world, right? Basically, they have told us yeah. they were able to migrate an existing microservice right over, leverage the uh, Quarkus capabilities to go native, to get faster, you know, smaller, faster, and of course, native compilation, which was so cool. But we are out of time for today. A couple other comments there. Edson Yanaga saying, "We I recommend Flyway for database migration. So he's trying to make that point there. We have an so extension maybe, for it. Yeah, so maybe next time you get to add that demo. <laughs> Yeah, and I love Just the Hibernate search. <laughs> I love the Hibernate search reference. By the yeah. way, I thought that was cool. That was super cool. I haven't seen that one yet. Well, thank you all for your time today. We do need to get out of here because we do have a thirty-minute time limit. Emmanuel, awesome job on that demonstration. Several people did catch the thank typo you. with the list dash extensions, so it was it was close. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. worries though. It yeah, all worked well, out great. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So you know, you guys know it was live today. Look for the recording and an email that comes out uh, from our marketing team. If not, do go to our, our standard channel on YouTube and you'll see all the recordings there as well. You can also go to the playlist I run on my channel. So you will have access to recording as soon as possible. But again, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Emmanuel. You're welcome and goodbye everyone. <laughs>